I'm Dr. Bregan, and I wanted to uh, invite uh, Dr. Cork up to uh, begin our uh, meeting today, and uh, we'll go here. It's a great program for today. I appreciate everybody being here. And uh, Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh, and I uh, just want to welcome everyone uh, to the special Grand Rounds. It's really an honor to honor uh, Craig, but I, I first want to give a uh, um, uh, welcome you and, and let you know that T is not here, T Mormon, and he gives his welcome. He couldn't be here this morning uh, from MSKI, and we're excited about it. And I'd like to welcome myself from Spine Center of Excellence. Uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce Brad here in just a second, give a formal introduction to, to Craig, but I'm going to take the, uh, um, the I'm going to take the 35 years of spine experience I have in this community to wax philosophical a little bit. When I trained at Winston, I came here after 10 years up in Winston, and there was somewhat of an adversarial relationship with the orthopedic, uh, uh, sur orthopedic spine surgeon, the neurospine surgeon. And I came down here, and it was definitely a different milieu. I almost immediately uh, began practice with Mark Hartman and uh, Sam Tuning, who were both awesome. We were in uh, neuropedics together, and it was clearly a different atmosphere that we really, I really relished. Uh, and, uh, but there was competition and you learn a lot about your competition, uh, especially by your complications and your second opinions. And it became clear after a very short period of time that, that, that this friendly competition and that, that Craig Brigham took competition very seriously. But, uh, but Craig was always uh, dedicated to the craft. He was dedicated to his patients. He was dedicated to evidence basis. And this was, you know, 20, 25 years ago, before evidence basis was in vogue, there was a lot of kind of, you know, cowboyism going on. And but Craig was a, a strict adherent to uh, evidence basis. He was an excellent technician, uh, and in, like I said, practicing in the same milieu, you, you got the idea of, of, of not just your complications, but their complications, how they handled them, and you know, second opinions and what people said about you as the competition. And although he was a fierce competitor, he was honest, hardworking. Uh, and, and, and it quickly became both a local, a regional, and a national uh, talent. So it was really an honor uh, to introduce uh, the, this Graham Rounds for Craig. But Craig was taken, obviously, uh, from us way too early. And uh, his shoes were filled by, by many people, but one of which was Bruce Darden. And, and he, although Bruce, just as fierce a competitor, he always gentlemanly, much more of the Southern gentleman, shall we say. And, uh, Craig was a little rough around the edges, but he was a you know, great guy. And, and Bruce was likewise, straight shooter, dedicated to his patients, dedicated to the craft, dedicated to spine surgery. They lifted up spine surgery in this community. We were able to, to come together as a community. And I'm proud to be uh, um, intro helping introduce him. I'm gonna bring up Brad Sagabarth, who's gonna give his actual introduction, but I had to say a few words because really just a phenomenal place to practice fine and a phenomenal, and, and my career was aided by the competition and the friendship that I, I made with, with, with these orthopedic spine surgeons that really become friends and partners my whole career. So Brad, thank you. Thanks, Don. I just have one, one slide on Craig, and there'll be more to come. The, uh, the spring spine uh, visiting guest lecture has been named after Craig Brigham uh, for his many contributions. And this marks the 10 year anniversary of his death. So, uh, one quick slide and, and more to come uh, from Bruce, but but Craig was a multi-talented leader an athletic background that was pretty incredible. He held the national decathlon record for 37 years before it was uh, beat. Uh, he's two-time All-American University of Oregon and ranked in the top 10 in the world for the decathlon in multiple years. But he was also a spine surgeon pioneer and took on the most difficult surgical problems with incredible skill. Um, but he also took on a more difficult challenge of uh, telling patients when they did not need surgery or when, when it would not help them. He'd always try to help them in other ways. He was a stalwart on the faculty here at the CMC and Atrium um, and OC Fellowship, a great educator, loved to teach, and he was really the ultimate role model uh, for developing surgeons. So in thinking of uh, who would be qualified for this uh, tribute, who's nationally known and has similar passion for, for teaching, has had a, a huge impact on the community, uh, we really, really didn't have to look far. 
So we have a local gem here, Dr. Bruce Darden, uh, born here in uh, North Carolina, high school valedictorian, uh, went to Davidson, graduated with honors, UNC Medical School, uh, stayed here for residency at CMC, uh, did a fellowship here at Baylor, and then came back and has practiced here in Charlotte uh, his whole career. So uh, I said this last night, and probably uh, bears repeating, but when you look around the room at the, the faculty here, uh, it's a pretty impressive group uh, of, of educators. And as educators, um, our business is really knowledge, and we're either, either creating it, transferring it, or applying it. And I can't think of one that more embodies that mission than, than Bruce Darden. So like many on this podium, he's well decorated in uh, over 60 publications and national presentations and editor of uh, multiple journals and uh, he's chairperson of our research committee. But he's had an active leadership role also in almost every relevant orthopedic spine society. He, of the most elite, probably a CSRS, he's past president, current president of the Lumbar Spine Research Society, and he was the OC Fellowship Program Director for 23 years. So Bruce is really a local hero who has done a lot to grow the national reputation of this program uh, through CMC and, and OC Spine in this community. And one of the unique things here is this visiting professor program. Or a lot of people may not know, but Bruce really helped to get this started. Even early in his career, uh, he's always been a great networker. And he and, and Dr. Ed Haley had a, a great uh, collegial relationship in supporting each other. But Bruce had uh, friends and contacts throughout the country and throughout the world uh, who are really nationally world renowned and, and brought them, invited them into Charlotte um, to display what we have here uh, for our program. And over the years, that's really seeded the country, uh, you know, as a billboard for us and really elevated our program. And I can speak as the fellowship director. Uh, it's made a, a huge difference in terms of putting us on the map. And uh, I think we're one of the most respected and sought after uh, fellowship programs in the country. Um, so I can uh, attribute that to, to Bruce laying the foundation. So when we look at some of the guest speakers that we've had over the years, these in the spine world, these are nationally and world renowned folks. And these are not just orthopedic spine surgeons, uh, this crosses neurosurgery as well. And so I'm happy and honored to, to add Dr. Darden to this list of distinguished professors. Bruce. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for letting me um, introduce um, Craig for the, um, the Wall of Fame for the MSKI. It's, it's kind of a labor of love. Um, I was talking to Dr. Beasley. I'm not the most qualified person to, um, to introduce Craig, but our careers were contemporaneous, and uh, I've known Craig in a lot of different, uh, under a lot of different hats. You know, first as a competitor, because we first I, we both started practice um, at the same time. I think I was the first fellowship trained orthopedist and spine to come back. And Miller Clinic was never going to be one upped by anybody else. So immediately they, um, they started uh, recruiting and um, found Craig, and we started the same year. So we were, we were thrown together as competitors, but then we did a lot of cases together as, as colleagues, as, as um, young attendings. Um, we became friends. A lot of different um, venues, and then eventually partners with OC when COS and Miller um, combined. So um, to know Craig, you really need to know his background. And um, as people alluded to, I, I may be the Southern gentleman, but Craig uh, was a West Coast man. Uh, he was born in Portland, uh, then he grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and he went to South Eugene High School. And at that time, um, Oregon, especially um, the University of Oregon, was a um, hotbed in track. But Craig's first love was gymnastics. And if you knew Craig, he was a big guy. He wasn't a small gymnastic-like person. He was, he, he was tall. He was very muscular. But um, at South Eugene High School, he became a very good gymnast. He, was the Oregon State champion in four exercise and high bar. And um, that was a love, but 
he really excelled as a track athlete, as, as Brad alluded to. He set the uh, National High School decathlon record, and um, this was kind of a Bob Beeman-esque type mm -hmm. record because he, as Brad alluded to, he held the record for 37 years. Uh, pretty impressive um, when you think about that. He was also the Oregon State champion in pole vault and high jump, which alluded to his, um, his athletic skills. Um, after high school, Craig um, continued his education and track career at uh, University of Oregon. And University of Oregon under Bill Bowerman, legendary, but this was one of the hotbeds in the United States in track and field. And back then, track and field was a lot more popular and evident. I mean, you would have, you didn't have a lot of sports on TV, but you always had specific track meets uh, that would be televised. And at the University of Oregon, he was a three-time Pac-8 uh, decathlon champ from 73 to 75. And he was fourth in 1973 and second in 1975 in the NCAA decathlon. He also had an international track career. Um, Craig finished 23 of 25 um, international meets and you know, as a decathlete having to do 10 events, you know, it's a grueling two days for, you know, for any of these athletes, but he was able to finish most of his meets. Uh, he was on three interna U.S. international teams. He was nationally ranked on five occasions, and, you know, after, as he's finished, finishing college, he contracted mononucleosis, so he was not able to, uh, to make the 76th Olympic team, uh, but he was able to, in several times to compete. Uh, he was with a U.S. five-man team that uh, defeated the Soviet Union back then in Poland, and he had a career best um, over 8,000 points at one, at one um, meet. Um, when you talk about Craig, you have to bring up Bruce Jenner. I'm told I'd be careful with this, but <laughs> um, Bruce was a competitor. I think they trained some together, so their careers Kind of paralleled each other, and you know when Craig was unable to you know, to go to the '76 Olympics, uh, Bruce Jenner was there, set a set a world record in the event, and probably behind Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier was one of the most popular athletes in the '70s in the U.S. But um, I found this quote um, at that time after he won the. Uh, won the gold medal, Jenner talking about his abilities, and he said that Craig was a much better athlete than he was at that time. Well, that was very interesting. Um, after finishing uh, at, at the University of Oregon, Craig went on to enroll in medical school at Northwestern University. So somebody that put that type of effort into a um, into an athletic career was still able to maintain um, a very good academic career. He got in uh, Northwestern. Um, he requested a two-year leave to train for the 1980 Olympics. And you know, with, with you know, Olympic events, you know, his aspirations uh, evaporated after President Carter's uh, boycott of the uh, Moscow Olympics in 1980. And um, I thought this was telling that um, you know, Craig was never bitter about this um, decision. You think you train your whole life for one event and it's you know the whole thing is squashed because of the political view. But um, I thought he was very magnanimous about his thoughts about the boycott and um, his inability to um, obtain his aspirational career um, at the Olympics. Um, so after yeah, after um, medical school, uh, Craig matched at uh, Northwestern the orthopedic residency, and um, the quote here kind of feeds into his athletic abilities that he thought that his strength as a physician uh, comes from his ability to work hard, concentrate for long periods, and keep plugging away, really, thoughts, um, you know, from his athletic career, which I think kind of shaped, um, you know, shaped his uh, medical career as well, and um, Craig is the second person on the left, and you may recognize the character right below him. 
So um, after after uh, residency, Craig uh, decided to do a spine fellowship, and one of the most prestigious fellowships at that time was with Dr. Ed Simmons. And Dr. Simmons had left Toronto, which was a hotbed of um, orthopedics at the time, and went to um, Buffalo and set up shop there. And um, Dr. Simmons, um, if you've ever met him, was a curmudgeonly character, um, but big personality. And his trademark was doing an operation that very few people did at that time. There were very few um, procedures for patients with advanced ankylosing spondylitis. You know, they lose the ability to see the horizon. So how do you how do you take care of these people? How do you maintain some functionality with them? And so um, Dr. Simmons developed a cervical thoracic osteotomy. You can see where he would um, remove some of the bone, uh, C7, C6, and then basically fracture you know, the ankylosed uh, anterior column and put the patient in the halo. And um, for the younger people in the audience, you gotta realize that when this was going on, we had no, we had no screws. We, didn't, we, we really had no rods. Um, the um, screws, hooks and rods in the cervical spine were only approved in, in probably the last 15 years. Uh, the FDA sat on it for a long time and we were not able to use this technology. So the only thing we had back then were, were basically um, wires, maybe a, a few pins and um, things of that sort. So after Dr. Simmons would do his osteotomy, he would put Steinman pins through the remaining spinous um, processes, hook these to wires in all types of forms and configurations, and then to make sure that the that the whole um, construct did not did not slip, they would put a big wad of methyl methacrylate cement over the wires and um, and, um, and uh, ends. And that was to hold it in place. And then the patient would go into a um, would go into a halo for an extended period of time. But we thought we have to tell one one Brigham story. And so that story kind of relates to this procedure. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Milan to come up quickly and um, tell this quick story. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> this is a correct story. Um, so Craig uh, was a masterful joke teller and, and storyteller. And the beauty of Craig, honestly, was the story was the exact same every time to the word. And when he passed away, I wrote down um, the story and put it on my computer. And uh, my computer went for an upgrade at North Carolina, got moved to the network drive, and disappeared. So. I'm, I'm unfortunately, I've lost the story in its, in its infinite detail that Craig would tell it every time. Um, but uh, the story goes, Craig was in fellowship with Dr. Simmons, um, and uh, they're in clinic the day before. Next day is going to be a busy OR day. Um, and this gentleman who fell, he had ankylosing spondylitis, he fell while well, in Texas and flew up to Buffalo, as Dr. Simmons had been seeing him. And Dr. Simmons had told him, do not let anybody touch you if you fall. So he had fractured his neck with ankylosing spondylitis, and he shows up to clinic, um, flown up, um, and Craig sees the gentleman and says, he just like, puts his hands to his face, and he's like, you know, this is going to extend my already long OR day tomorrow. We're already scheduled to be there till 5 o'clock. You know, doing, it, doing this type of surgery, is, you know, we're going to be there after midnight. So um, anyway, long story short, sure, they admit the patient, they get through their day, last case of the day, they're doing this. And when they do this surgery, so they would do this patient sitting upright, um, and they would run, run traction to the ceiling, um, and would do the patient awake. So you would use local anesthetic for this for this entire procedure. Um, so you would, you would dissect the spine from C2 to T2, um, and uh, walk the patient away. Uh, so they uh, get to the point where, you know, they're, they're looking at the neck, 
Um, and one of, the, one of the principles of Simmons, you would always say, you know, if a patient, if an ankylosing spondylitis patient uh, fractures a neck, you really just want to, you want to fix them in the position they were in. You don't want to do anything spectacular. Um, you don't really want to try to realign them. So, um, so long story made short, uh, Simmons has a, the guy in position. He goes, eh, I think let's give him a little bit of an osteotomy. So he, he cracks, he cracks his, the neck a little bit more, realigns the patient, and tells Craig to scrub out and go check on him. So the guy's sitting there, and before the surgery, you know, he's moving everything, and um, basically Craig said, tells him to move. He's like, I mean, what, he's in a halo, so he can't even move his head. He's like, he like shrugs his shoulders a little bit. That's it. Has no function in his hands. So Craig, um, he's apoplectic. <laughs> And he would, uh, so he goes, he runs back around to where Dr. Simmons is. He goes, Dr. Simmons, Dr. Simmons, he can't move. And Simmons goes, what? And he walks back around the guy and he says, tells the nurse and says, give me a needle. Starts stabbing the guy in his knee, in his legs, he's bleeding. Um, oh and uh, he goes, he, he walks over to Craig and goes, huh, I guess he is paralyzed. <laughs> so he goes, he goes what do you think we should do? And this Bezoar had already been placed on the spine with methyl methacrylate. I mean, they were basically done with the case, getting ready to close. Um, and there was a resident at uh, in Buffalo who went on to become a sports medicine uh, team physician, actually for the NFL, um, who was there, um, who was there scrubbing the case. And uh, Craig goes, well, Dr. Simmons, we can't leave the patient like this. I mean, we're going to have to, you know, we have to take everything out. You know, put him back into the position he came in and not, not have any correction. And he goes, and again, Craig's like, you know, now we just had another five hours of this case. Um, so the, this resident takes the, um, basically had a, took a curette and just basically peeled off this methylene with acrylate, the Simon pins, the whole, like the whole entire spine, it's like a lobster tail came off the back. Um, they repositioned the guy's neck and everything starts working again. So, uh, so they placed this, placed this gentleman in traction in the hospital for six weeks because they had no way to fix it. So the guy's basically, you know, laying there in the bed with traction uh, and uh, a halo. Um, but everything worked after that. So, <laughs> again, fuse them in the position they came in. <laughs> After the um, fellowship, as I mentioned, Craig was recruited here by Miller Clinic, and he became a partner with some of these gentlemen that you probably know. Um, and while Craig's been here, these are just some of the um, innovations that have been taking place in the spine community, and Craig has been an integral part of a lot of these. <laughs> And if you talk about Craig, you've got to talk about Brigham isms. And Brad was nice enough to uh, give me a few, and there's, our time does not let us go through all of these. So I kind of highlighted a few that I really liked, um, such as this patient is a megalomorph, and <laughs> the spine will yield to my masculine will. You <laughs> better been around Craig. And probably the most common one, uh, another extremely difficult surgery made to look ridiculously simple. Um, and they continue. Uh, I wish we had time for all of these. These are just a few of my other favorite ones. And to know Craig, um, th this is basically, this is basically Craig and all of us. How many times do we hear this? You know, it's all about the money. Procedures, procedures, procedures. Um, and he really took on a, a, a role trying to trying to bring some sense to spine surgery and he that was kind of his raison d'etre that i talk about um, as we go on but um craig kind of helped recruit dr niesel here to charlotte we're, we're sure glad that he did and probably for the first 10 years that dr niesel was here we really didn't know that his first name was jeff we thought his first name was my best friend, Jeff Niesel. And these characters made a habit of um, showing up at Starbucks at, um, 
5 30 in the morning i think they started out wanting to solve all the world's problems and as jeff alludes to they they morphed into these characters down here um i never knew these moment characters but this is um i'm gonna mess it up again uh waldorf and statler who were the guys in the in the balcony always kind of um talking shit about uh, <laughs> another character so i think uh I think Nisla and Brigham were um, well on their way uh, with these two characters. Um, Craig um, also took care of a lot of professional athletes. Um, I think his athletic background and his confidence in handling patients uh, really resonated um, with the athletes and with the agents. And he was able to um, inspire trust in them. So he had a lot of, especially NFL players, come. Um, and as we were talking about last night, he rarely knew who these people were. Maybe like when Peyton Manning came, he knew who Peyton was. But for a lot of these guys, the resident fellow really had to clue him in as to who he was taking care of. Um, but he had um, a lot of a lot of these athletes that would come and get opinions from him. Um, Craig was really known for his stamina with these long, um, arduous uh, deformity cases. Um, and I think it was a lot in his athletic background, as he alluded to, that would allow him to uh, handle these cases. And I don't think there are many of us um, that have had patients that uh, have undergone a total hip and a lumbar fusion under the same anesthesia. But uh, that was Craig. I mean, he was he was down in the OR after this procedure, within a day or two, checking on everybody. And I think back in the OR uh, within within three weeks. So. His, his toughness is, is not to be challenged. Um, I will say, I have to throw this in. I think these traits also led to him ignoring some of his medical problems. So it's one thing to be tough, but please don't ignore your medical problems. Um, Craig was a teacher and mentor. Um, he started with the residents at CMC and um, he was the winner of the resident teaching award four times. And, Dr. Niesel didn't want me to bring it up, but he, he did tell me that during the Hanley era, that Northwestern graduates won over a third of the uh, teaching awards. So I won't, I won't mention that. But uh, Craig was a, uh, he, he was an integral part of, of Ed Hanley's uh, Spine Fellowship. And then after we merged uh, the Ortho Carolina Spine Fellowship, um, Craig, usually his, after after Starbucks, he would come over and work on pet projects at the Spine Center on the weekends. So he was always available to assist partners um, that may have a tough case on the weekend and need you know, either um, some assistance or some guidance with these cases. So Craig was always available for those, always willing to chip in uh, for these tough cases. And if you were going to present before him at Spine Conference, <laughs> you really only need to prepare one case because he could grind through a case, one case for an hour if need be. So um, the residents will always ask, who's going to be at Spine Conference? Is it going to be Brigham? So uh, only need to prepare one case. Um, and he was also a leader. Uh, Craig was integral um, during the, the Miller um, COS um, merger. Um, he was president of the group at that time. Um, he was always very loyal. When a lot of the um, spine physicians um, left the Miller Clinic, he stayed on, stayed the course, and then helped guide the organizations to a very successful merger. He was the leader in the um, residency program as well as the uh, spine sub specialty societies. Um, his his really his, his main drive was to bring about responsibility in spine care. And if he were still alive, I think he would still be taking on this project because it was it was what drove him uh, to really protocol spine to bring some you know basically some sense in how you handle a lot of patients, especially with back pain. Um, Craig loved his family, his daughters, uh, Emily, Esther, and then Faith. And um, 
he has, has been a friend to all of us. I always tell somebody, if you want to see the mark that Craig made, just look in the eyes of, um, of our uh, younger partners, residents and fellows. You can always tell how much he meant um, to everyone um, from that standpoint. So Craig, we honor and salute you and we appreciate all your um, contributions to orthopedic training. And um, he's always been a teacher, a leader, a colleague and a friend. So uh, I present you Dr. Brigham. So um, Dr. Garden has a, uh, a talk for us here in a few minutes, but that was a great lead in. So we wanted to uh, officially introduce um, the next addition to our uh, uh, wall of uh, fame. And I was gonna ask Dr. Niesel to uh, say a few words about uh, yeah. words. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was fantastic, Bruce. Really, I mean, that was a, a fantastic summary. Uh, the only uh, actual words that I could say is, you know, Craig, uh, Craig really enjoyed uh, being a character as well as uh, <laughs> demonstrating character. So I, I'm wearing my Northwestern purple to honor him, and he would love the mock this of this because it turns out that our Northwestern logo looks a lot like. No font. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so you can only imagine in my role, the chief surgical officer, if I walk in the boardroom and I do this, the anxiety that it provokes. And again, Craig, not being one to judge a book by its cover, you know, I would th I will then slowly peel off my jacket like this and show Northwestern on my shoulders, which which takes all the executives out of the tack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Craig would greatly enjoy that. So I got I said what, what better tribute to my buddy than to sit there and bring a laugh on, on his behalf. <laughs> so uh, I think everybody knows upstairs in the MSKI we uh, have um, you know begun to accumulate portraits um, that are all been commissioned by Fred Marshall uh, of the people who really represent the history of orthopedics and spine surgery in Charlotte. And, you know, as, as the committee was sort of looking and building that collection, um, Craig was an easy addition to that group. And um, COVID threw us off a little bit with uh, sort of our official unveilings. Many of you probably remember the uh, Mike Bossy virtual unveiling uh, during COVID, but uh, we wanted to take this opportunity at the uh, 10th anniversary of uh, Craig's passing to uh, present the, um, the portrait that hangs upstairs of Dr. Craig Brigham. So. All right. Thank you, Bruce. I'd like to uh, just to give a, a quick talk about about research. Um, I've noticed that you know, in specialty societies look at looking at CVs, we have a lot of people who, as a resident or a or a fellow. We're very active in research, but then you look at their CV when they go into private practice, it really falls off the table. Um, you know, they either don't have the the ability to um, continue research, or time gets in the way. And I've never seen that really talked about in any of these specialty societies. So, what I thought would be um, Kind of interesting would be to look into this topic and um, see what you know what can be done or what what guidelines there are for for helping people in private practice continue their research career. So this is mostly towards the graduating residents and fellows. Thanks. So have no disclosures um, on this topic. Um, so when you consider research in private practice, basically, you know, something has to give timelines. I mean, because you know, we're busy, we want to establish a, you know, a clinical practice. So why do you why would you want to consider it? Um, there are a lot of reasons um, that 
are that tie into a proper practice. It really it keeps your practice cutting edge and relevant. It continues the lifelong learning that we've had um, throughout our careers. It gives you a possible head start on new technology. There's personal satisfaction. There's entrepreneurship. It can distinguish you from, from your peers. It can help you advance in societies. And if you ever want to make the transition uh, to an academic career, you know, if you have a firm bridge at your continuing um, learning and uh, participating. It helps prevent burnout. Um, so there are good reasons to consider uh, research um, in, in private practice. So my own personal journey, just very quickly, um, you know, I went, I went to a um, liberal arts college and, and there really wasn't a lot of research done by the faculty there. So there really weren't many opportunities as a um, undergrad for research. And I don't know, maybe correct me, I don't remember it ever stressed in any pre-med meeting or talking about uh, applications or whatever. I'm not sure in our applications, there was any section to put your research. Uh, yes, <laughs> and so it, it really wasn't a factor um, applying to medical school. And then in medical school, you really had to seek it out to be able to participate in it. It wasn't like if you were interested, say, in orthopedics, they were going to recruit you to help with studies. It just, you know, you, you really had to had to figure out a faculty member who might be interested. But I really don't know many of my colleagues who, who did it. And then here in residency, it, it, it wasn't a requirement to finish. But um, as we started along, most of us kind of had one pet project in mind was unicameral bone cysts. And um, it, it parlayed uh, to the Oscar Miller Day um, Best Paper Award. And then secondarily, it, it, it got accepted at the AO Residence and Fellows Conference in Salt Lake City. And at, at that time, we got to ski. Um, you know, they, they had a bar at, uh, at Park City. So you know, this was a pretty cool way to parlay a little research into a lot of fun. So I uh, kind of got the bug there. And then in fellowship, um, we had a lot more research opportunities um, with the physician who was in private practice, as well as a, a, a faculty appointment at Baylor. And it was my first exposure to the, um, to the specialty societies um, and really saw that you could engage thought leaders um, and you know, on, on a personal level and be able to converse with them. So really got a bug there. Um, when I came back here, I had teaching responsibilities um, and a desire to, to participate in CSRS and SRS, which were the two large uh, spine societies at that time. So as was available, starting with retrospective uh, clinical reviews, and that's what helped me get in these societies. But then um, Dr. Hanley, as a, as a mentor, was kind enough to look over papers, you know, to really kind of critique them, help me prepare them um, for publication. And then as our practice grew more complex so that we had more patients, we were able to do randomized studies. But really the development of a research institute was, was a true turning point. Um, and after the merger, we were able to set up the North Carolina Research which, um, is a 501-3C uh, corporation. We have a board of directors, uh, and then we have the research advisory committee, which Dr. Pat and Rachel Seymour are, are both members, and we vet um, all the studies that come before us. Uh, we serve 27 residents, 84 physicians. Uh, we man they manage Oscar Miller Day, and most of the physicians are city trained. Um, and we'll talk about that should be familiar with red cap management. Um, so I'm proud to say you know, that the organization is self-funded. Um, we have over 200 investigator-initiated studies right now, uh, published 78 manuscripts in, in 22, and the studies involving um, residents and fellows are over 150 uh, current um, studies. Um, these are a list of services that Oak Creek provides, but we also really value our 
collaboration with, with Atrium and then uh, UNC Charlotte's to provide services that we don't have the ability to. And one of our key projects I think everybody's heard about is uh, Carolina's uh, opioid reduction effort. Um, I just will touch on this briefly, but you can see the red areas represent more than 20 overdose deaths per 100,000 uh, people from 2002 to 14. You can see how this has really become an ep epidemic. And while we only represent in the U.S. 5% of the global population, we account for 75% of the opioid uh, use globally. And so can we change that? And so the Duke Endowment was nice enough to give us two grants. Uh, the first to look at development implementation of evidence-based strategies to reduce opioid prescription on elective orthopedic surgery. So we did randomized studies in most of the um, subspecialties on one or two procedures, and we had collaboration throughout the community, which was which was excellent. And we found that all these procedures will allow for opioid-free pathways. <coughs> but then the second uh, arm of this grant is to disseminate these protocols um, and develop educational material for the hospital systems in um, the Duke Endowment's catchment area, as well as to provide uh, modules for EPIC. And we're in negotiations to do this for the National Spine Health Foundation, who um, a lot of the Spines subspecialty organizations are um, aligned with uh, for patient advocacy. So, as um, I started thinking about this topic, I just wanted to poll a lot of the um, the thought leaders um, throughout the, the country, and you can see some of the people I either talk to directly or um, by email about their thoughts about how do you how do you keep people involved in in research, and they were all nice enough to uh, provide um, information to me. The one that, that stood out uh, more than anything else was mentorship. Um, everyone stressed that this was a critical step in continuing your um, your research, and um, most people stress you shouldn't wait for this to develop organically. You've got to go out and seek a mentor. And this could be somebody local or it could be somebody from your residency or fellowship that you may have established a relationship with. And the benefits of this, they can introduce you for writing assignments, possibly for uh, editorial um, opportunities and then the specialty societies. And then possibly for multi-center research studies and helping you with organization. And the right mentor is someone who, who knows how to do this, enjoys it, and has the time to do it. So it, it's, if you're thinking about research, you've got to actively pursue your mentor. You can't just wait for somebody to come to you. Um, some of the initial steps that you can take in practice, um, one is to be city trained. Um, this is a private module, it's available on the um, internet. And they have two modules that you need to be current with you review and take tests with each section of the modules. And both of the IRBs here in town, uh, Wake Forest Atrium and Novant, required the good clinical practice and biomedical research uh, modules to be up to date, to be you know, part of a um, uh, uh, primary investigator or to uh, present to the IRB. The uh, National Institute of Health, their Office of Clinical Research has a lot of modules, online courses about how to set up research, uh, and, and they're very helpful as well. Um, one good way to, to get involved would be to volunteer for a local IRB. Uh, this allows you to learn the process, what you need to do to present studies, and then how to critique the studies going forward. And then um, volunteer opportunities, you know, as we've mentioned. Um, everybody mentioned to get involved with multicentral center trials as soon as possible, but make sure that you have the patient population for this. You don't want to volunteer and not have um, the population to carry through, um, you know, with the research. 
And as we're starting, um, you know, most of us aren't like like um, the Rothman Institute where there are minions running around um, and just dole out studies to all these um, different people. You know, typically, especially a smaller private practice, don't have the inordinate amount of help to um, you know, to carry through research. So it's always important to find good people early on um, to develop this research environment. And one thing that we've done um, in North Carolina, our physicians pool money to hire a dedicated research coordinator. And at first that probably is not uh, practical if you're on your own and thinking about research, but uh, medical assistants are a good economical way to start. Um, these individuals can review the, you know, the, the records for potential patients and bring these forward. They can um, also help with patient recruitment. And a lot of the sponsors for um, industry-driven studies are looking for more diverse patient populations. So sometimes to um, incentivize these patients, I mean, these MAs or um, your recruitment staff to find um, diversity in, in patient population is very worthwhile. And then to train these people in enrollment, follow-up, and data collection, good way to start. Um, you can also get involved, especially if there's a local university looking for a basic science partner with whom to, um, to collaborate. These individuals are usually um, happy to have your clinical expertise and be able to weigh in on the, um, the clinical relevance of, of, of their research. Um, Susan Oda mentioned a master's of public health at a local university. These individuals have a tend to have a well-rounded knowledge of healthcare uh, data management. And they can look over um, data mining uh, from that standpoint. And then a, a statistician always comes in handy. Um, so one way to develop papers is to look at data mining. And if this is done well, the right questions are asked and answered, you can um, have some high yield um, papers from this. Um, you know, the databases usually have a large sample size and can be representative of the entire country as a whole. And you can investigate trends in, um, in, in different clinical topics. Um, and the use, as I'm gonna show you on graphs, has really increased significantly over the last decade. Uh, but you do need someone who is used to looking at this type of data, looking at large spreadsheets. And sometimes people in the business office um, have this expertise because they're used to looking at spreadsheets from a business intelligent, intelligence standpoint. And if not, uh, you can look at the local university, such as epidemiologists or the masters of public health, and then possibly um, pre-med students who need research um, experience. So you can see how over the, um, over the last couple of decades, how the number of articles uh, per specialty has increased and we'll have to hand it to our spine colleagues. We kind of have led the, led the way with, this, with these database articles. I think probably 90% of them have come out of um, Vanderbilt. That's another, another topic. And you can see that the, the databases that are typically used, these include the National Inpatient Sample and the NISQIP um, registry are the two most commonly used. And the databases fall into two different categories. And these are the administrative databases that usually will pull randomized samples um, from, um, from large databases, including CMS data, and then private databases um, that will pull from insurance um, data. And these most common one you hear about is Pearl Diver, but there's also market scan in Premier. Premier actually is based here in Charlotte. And then on the other arm, you have registries or clinical databases, and the most common one is, is um, NISQIP. And there are pros and cons of all these databases, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but the private ones are administrative, all ages are representative. And you can have long-term follow-up. Um, the problems with them 
they are private patients called from private insurance data. It tends to be fairly expensive. There's some coding flaws um, in them. You can you can lose uh, patients to follow up, and the data is aggregated. So you get the data in tables, and um, you have to answer a specific question. If you want to pull out um, another question in tables, you may not be able to do that. NISQIP, which is a large registry, um, is, is high quality data, it's prospective, inpatient, and 30 days post discharge. Um, but you are somewhat limited as, as to the outcomes that are collected. And if you're participating in it, it's free to contributors. But if you're not, there is an expense with it. But the problem is, there's a fairly high charge getting started, it costs me $100,000 to. Um, to set up the infrastructure for the registry. So you know, it's usually large teaching hospitals that have direct, direct access to NISQIP. The national inpatient sample is administrative, all ages, is retrospective, and really is a true nationwide sample. But you know, again, there are some coding flaws with this. Individual patients cannot be tracked. And then finally, there's Medicare, which enables long-term follow-up um, there's CMS samples done by the third party, and as with Medicare, older patients, and there, there are expenses with this, and can be coding flaws. So as far as um, funding uh, research, there are different ways you can do it. Yeah, the most common one is to fund your own, your own studies. Um, you know, if it's a retrospective study or a small prospective study, um, there may not be a lot of expenses with it, but the advantages are you control the data, you control how to conduct the study. Um, the second way to do this is with industry funding. Um, and if you've been involved with these, such as like with the um, disc arthroplasties, um, the industry controls the protocol. And if they don't like the findings, they may push you not to publish this. So unfortunately, there, there can be industry um, intervention on the free access of this information. Uh, never will forget um, Jan Goffin in Belgium was the lead was the lead researcher on um, the Brian disc and he saw that there was heterotopic ossification with this and I think the, um, the industry at that time was ready to pull him off the podium when he had the the wherewithal to get up there and talk about this. Um, so industry can um, basically push you not to publish or not to allow free access to their data going forward. And there may be some contractual control over that as well as far as results, presentation, and publication. And then the last arm of funding is non-industry. This is typically grants from government sources, especially societies or independent endowments. Um, this usually involves a formal grant review process, um, and the nice thing about this, they can give you feedback about how to improve your study, and typically they'll let you control the, the data and publication of this. So industry funding, um, there are so many products and drugs in the pipeline. Uh, I saw one estimate of 30,000 um, different um, possible um, things that need to be evaluated. So this is gonna require a huge number of study sites and academic sites alone are not able to handle this volume. And then the second thing, the, the pace of development uh, really calls for rapid enrollment to keep costs down. So this has the company seeking non-traditional uh, sites for participation in their um, clinical research. And it gives private practice an opportunity to participate in these, um, these studies and can allow for a non-traditional income source depending on uh, how you structure this. So you have to ask yourself if you're getting involved in clinical uh, industry funded research, um, do you have intellectual interest to do this? Um, are you willing to take responsibility for oversight for patient participation? And there are liability implications, there are rule of law implications, and 
and then there are ethics concerns. Uh, the Sunshine Act reports all income to the primary investigator. So on the site, this all gets reported, even though a lot of this money may be then folded back into paying for, uh, you know, for uh, research um, help, but it is reported to the primary investigator. And then can you build a business model that allows for success with ongoing studies? Um, so it's important if you're doing this to be informed, to really know the business of conducting and managing a safe, ethical, clinical study. And there are multiple resources out there. There are LinkedIn groups, there are conferences, there are um, governmental sources, and then there are clinical research networks that you can lean on. Um, there are documents through this CFR and the Internal Council of Harmonization that can help you set up the studies. And then the City Good Clinical Practice Module provides some of that as well. Um, and a lot of a lot of people stress that having combined responsibilities for research personnel is run, not really a good formula for long-term clinical success. It, the ability to manage data, the regulatory IRB concerns, so on and so forth, really, as you go along, will take up a lot of time. And it's difficult for, say, like an MA or a nurse, clinical nurse in the office, to handle both this and the, um, the clinical concerns. And then there is the business model of doing this billing collection that's different from traditional um, clinical care. So once you reach a certain size, it's really important to have dedicated staff to increase your efficiency. Um, so if you decide that this is more than a one-off, you really need to um, establish the infrastructure that includes operations, financials, technology, regulatory, um, and strong understanding of patient recruitment and enrollment um, to get this done. Um, one way to help with this is to combine with other sites is let you leverage the cost of technology and training. Uh, it may allow collaboration with, with the business part of this, the marketing, it may facilitate your participation in uh, future studies. And then this, as I mentioned, adds workflow. So you need to have standard procedures with these patients. You know, how do you discuss the protocols you know, outside the clinical workflow? So you need to establish protocols to make this flow smoothly and not interfere with uh, practice. And always keep the, uh, the patient front and center. Um, a lot of people stress that it's important to talk about research to your patients. So if a study comes along, they've heard about it, they'll know the, um, that you participate in, in research and that there are benefits to this. So it kind of sets the stage you know, to help them participate. Um, and you always have to balance this with good um, clinical care and helps recruit the patients. So um, quickly in conclusion, um, it can be done, research can be done in private practice. It has many advantages and rewards to a private practice. Mentors are, are critically important. Um, there are many ways to start to volunteer, to start this, this process. Um, look for collaborations with local universities. Um, Enthusiastic staff, no matter their background, can help jumpstart the process. Um, data mining um, is a good way to get studies um, quickly uh, into publication. And then as you acquire the patient populations, uh, clinical trials with dedicated staff um, can be very worthwhile as well. So I appreciate um, the audience. Um, it was really privileged to um, present Craig so thanks for the opportunity. Bruce, that's a phenomenal uh, sort of review of things. And I think it's really the epitome of honestly what we as a orthopedic and spine program here have to offer Wake Forest. I mean, they have nothing like that in Winston-Salem. And they're really not a lot like this in the entire country where we have an academic group two independent practices that all participate and collaborate in research. I mean, it's 
just doesn't exist anywhere else. So I think, uh, and there are a lot of lessons um, and hopefully, like you said, you know, not, not everybody, but you know, statistically, I think about a third of our graduates end up in some sort of academic type practice and two thirds in independent practice. And this is a great way to, you know, keep your, your brain on the cutting edge to, you know, a lot of these side benefits that you discuss here. So I think that's a, a really good thing for, for residents to see how do you, how do, you do it? I, mean, I think it, I think it speaks to everybody to see an essay to, you know, to Wake Forest Atrium, to us to be able to have this many research opportunities, you know, for our residents and fellows. I mean, and it's, it's borne out by the, you know, by the volume of studies that, that we do compared, you know, to the universities. And I think that's one of those under the radar factors that, um, that really gets um, overlooked. And there's one reason I wanted to take this on to present this to LSRS, um, you know, just to let people know what's, you know, what, what we do. Cause I think it's, I mean, everybody, you know, knows Dom and CNSA and, you know, they, they know a lot about us, but I don't think they know, you know, research to this extent. So keep beating the drums out there. Yeah. <laughs> Any comments? Anybody online? Well, thanks, sir. Oh, okay. Question. Yeah. So, um, one of the reasons that um, I think the private practices were so successful in doing research here was because we didn't have a medical school and there wasn't an academic option in the community available. Now that there is, do you think it's going to be challenging to maintain private practice research as opposed to it all folding in? And do you see any value in it being maintained in the private practice setting as opposed to in an academic? Yeah, I, mean, I think there, I think there are a lot of advantages. I mean, you you, you get a, a, a different perspective. Um, I think we have huge clinical volumes that if we don't tap those patients, we're going to lose that. And I think, you know, that's something that that at least from the North Big standpoint, I'm not sure Wake Forest has has that to offer. And just like the Duke Endowment, I mean. I don't think a university is going to go after a, a big <coughs> private endowment to look at, you know, look at a question like this. And I mean, I think we're we're a little bit leaner and 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 hungrier, so we kind of go after these opportunities. And they're they're more out there, untapped. There are more endowments that you know are willing to I think to look at this source and and, and fund, you know, um, you know, relevant research. So I, I think it's I think it's out there. I think. I think we'll stay relevant and hopefully be able to fold in the residents uh, and fellows to want to continue this as they get into practice. So, yeah, I think, and hopefully we'll stay that way. Yeah, Dan, it's a great point. You know, um, Dr. Mormon, Dr. Seymour, and I met with Dean Bulware, our new dean, just last week and presented a lot of the data that you just saw about the number of publications out of our combined groups. And honestly, I don't think she knows yet what to do with us because it was eye-opening, you know, they're not coming into a place and saying, hey, we're now an academic institution, let's start doing research. They have an unbelievable portfolio of things already happening and, and an established track record. I mean, she was literally sort of sitting there and that's why we've had some troubles with the, you know, academic integration because I think some folks didn't really understand. And let's be honest, not every department at Atrium is the same as MSKI. Probably not many of them compared to what we do. So I think it really is that they're trying to figure out, wow, how do we how do we ride this? Dump? Yeah, if I could just add on, that's a fastball down the middle, you know, and I think you know that, Dan, uh, because uh, it is there is a uniqueness about this. If you look at the at the country, you look at the you know big academic centers, and and you know I don't want to name you know Cleveland Clinic, you know uh, other ones uh, that they take six months to get through IRB and then they roll two patients and randomize you know one uh, and or you private <laughs> practice and you've got a giant volume and you you've got like Bruce was talking about you've got like your PA trying to fill out CRFs and it's a disaster uh, and so we really hit the sweet spot with both of our groups and then we have large volume clinical practices, good work, 
and and we enroll patients and we get great data. And as you know, you were number one enroller in the ProDisc, uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial disc study. We've been number one, two enrollers, just like you guys with most studies. We are sought after both of our organizations because of that. And that uniqueness and that sweet spot needs to be maintained, I would I would say definitely. So thanks for the fastball. <laughs> and and I, I'm sure you guys are like us, Tom. You know, we're doing it compared to Cleveland Clinic. We're doing it on you know a shoestring budget, sure. right? I mean, uh -huh. I mean for what for what our organizations get for, for our budget compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars they have in their research endowment, you know, it, it's just no comparison. But like Josh says, the output, if you look at the output, is it's phenomenal. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've got a bunch of our publications through N squared QOD, uh, uh, which is the neurosurgery outcome, which became now is in the ASR, you know, double AOS and double ANS. And, um, you know, we're the, the private practice groups, uh, you know, typically for in the United States, it's typically on the neurosurgery side, CNSA, uh, um, uh, UT Memphis, which is you know private practice hybrid uh, group, and the Indianapolis group, same thing. They're constantly the top enrollers in those registries and in those subsequent papers, and that's an important thing that could that shouldn't be lost here. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Cool. All on my comment. Bruce, you're just colleagues in town and been here 15 years. You know, you've you've had a distinguished career and you, you know you really just led by example we, we've just appreciated you know for what, what you've done here clinically in, in this region and certainly on a national level that's a really set sort of a benchmark and a, and a you know, really good example for a lot of us to look towards and, and in terms of our careers and what we ought to look for in our subspecialty and, and practices and, and you know simpler size and, and, and aspirations and cares so uh, you know, we appreciate all you've done thanks thank you Thank you.